for a year and pay less than 71 pesos per month. Visit tmt.ph slash digital to get your free 30 days of the Manila Times Digital Edition. The renewable energy industry in the Philippines is experiencing a dramatic expansion as the country faces a strong demand for new sources of power to support its rapid economic growth. With abundant sunlight, increasingly affordable technology, and growing investor interest, the solar energy sector is poised to take advantage of these opportunities. The Philippine government has allocated 7,000 megawatts of power generation to add to the country's existing capacity over the next five years. With its commitment to reduce 70% of carbon emissions by 2030, renewable energy is the most viable option to meet this tremendous demand. WeGen has entered the Philippines with a unique proposition, one that will revolutionize the energy sector. WeGen is a next-generation energy tech company that uses rapidly advancing renewable energy, battery storage, and software technologies to develop energy solutions for homes, communities, schools, and small businesses to large industrial and commercial properties, resorts, and even entire islands. Our name, WeGen, reflects our belief in the democratization of energy. We, families, communities, and businesses can produce or generate and share all the power we need, transforming consumers into prosumers. WeGen offers three distinct solutions to our customers. Residential or commercial solar solutions, solar PV, battery storage, and smart software solutions for homes, schools, churches, hospitals, and businesses produces energy bills and provides emergency power. Standalone Island Solutions replaces diesel and fossil fuels with a mix of renewables. For example, solar, wind, biomass, and smart software. Ideal for eco-resorts and small islands. And distributed power plants. Aggregation and supply of energy can serve as reserve capacity to provide power during peak load hours. At the heart of WeGen is its commitment to community development and social change for marginalized sectors in the country. We envision the eradication of energy poverty towards sustainable development for all. From job creation to ecological conversion, WeGen believes in expanding the horizons for underserved communities through energy aggregation and democratization. WeGen has dedicated itself to bridging gaps and building sustainable communities through clean and affordable energy solutions for all. WeGen, the power of sharing.
的玫瑰，路旁的泥浪，路远可能马吉丁，沙漠的雾气，地卡巴西西，沙达卡塔布鲁沙西木亚，沙拉吉梅布卡，麦德拉冈布拉，阿乌沙帕拉伊布拉，阿哈，阿古萨纳乌塔乌鲁伊塔布，拜纳纳尼尼尼。Ang bituin at araw niya kailan pa may di magdiri Ang panahaw na luwal at ipusunta Uwe lang isa pinuho At hindi kaya na pag may mga adit Ang umatay ng tanit sa iyo Good morning. Thank you to all of you for joining us uh, for our forum today, Boost the Future of Power Stakeholders. Uh, I'm Ben Kritz, the charming and delightful columnist and doer of many things here at the Manila Times. And this morning, I'm joined by my good friend and colleague, Editor Conrad Carino. Good morning, Conrad. Yeah, good morning, Ben. Today's forum is brought to you by the Manila Times and our co-presenter, WeGen Energy Philippines. A special thank you to WeGen, and we'll be hearing much more from them later on in the program. I'd also like to give a special thank you to our sponsor, the National Grid Corporation of the Philippines, and our special partner, SunSmart Solar Power Technology Incorporated. Cheers to you and cheers to the sun. And of course, none of this would be possible without our organization partners, the British Chamber of Commerce of the Philippines, the Cebu Chamber of Commerce, French Chamber of Commerce, Dabao Chamber of Commerce, the Financial Executive Institute of the Philippines, the Italian Chamber of Commerce of the Philippines, the Management Association of the Philippines, Nordic Chamber of Commerce of the Philippines Incorporated, the Philippine Center for Islam and Democracy, and She Talks Peace. And last, but by no means least, our media partner, the Manila Times TV. Okay, enough preamble. Uh, keeping up with the ever-growing demand for energy in the Philippines has always been a challenge, and particularly now so that we face a change in government, a variety of economic pressures, and a worsening global climate crisis. Fortunately, the rapid growth and development of renewable energy in the past several years has presented options that the country could have only dreamed about 10 years ago or even five years ago. Remarkable in innovations in renewable energy technology, in energy markets, and in involving re regulation present a wide range of opportunities for energy consumers, producers, and investors alike. The future indeed looks bright if we want it to be, which is why we are here this morning. And with that, I am pleased to introduce our keynote speaker, Department of Energy Se Un Undersecretary Felix William Fuentebella. Uh, attorney Fuentebella, known as Wimpy to his friends and fans, is currently the Senior Undersecretary for Power, Renewable Energy, Planning, and Investment of the Department of Energy. Um, prior to his current role at the DOE, he oversaw media affairs and served as the spokesman for the department. <clears throat> he hails from Camarina Sur, where he served as congressman of the 4th, which used to be the 3rd legislative district. And as a member of the House of Representatives of the Philippines, he was instrumental in the passage of several bills, including the Anti-Money Laundering Act and amendments to the Procurement Act. He earned his Bachelor of Science in Business Administration in 1997 from the University of Philippines and studied law at the Ateneo Law School and the San Sebastian College Recoletos Institute of Laws, passing his bar examination in 2009. He began his government career in 1997 as a political affairs officer and, apart from his service in Congress, has also served as the Housing Commissioner of the Housing and Land Use Regulatory Board and Deputy Secretary, Secretary General of the Housing and Urban Development Coordinating Council. Now, being a very busy undersecretary, he is... Uh, currently on a mission to distant parts of the country, and so he has provided a videotape uh, address for us this morning, so we'll hear that now. We would like to thank Manila Times for inviting us 
to this Business Forum highlighting energy innovations for 2022. Our media partners have always been an important stakeholder that plays a role as the DOE builds on and implements innovative ways to ensure sustainable solutions to pressing energy challenges such as energy security, access, and climate change. Media holds the crucial tool of raising awareness on energy developments and reforms and eventually increasing the success rate of our endeavors. Today, we will be discussing about innovations and emerging technologies. Total electrification is and will always be the core socially responsive program of the Department of Energy. As we light up every household in the far-flung areas of the country, we know that this will create a bubble of development among our small and medium-scale enterprises, thereby transforming the lives of our marginalized sectors. What has been done in this area? In December 2021, we recorded a 95.4% household electrification level, wherein 25 million households are now enjoying electricity services. However, about 1.06 million households are still in the DOE's radar for electrification. A feat was already achieved by the energy sector in 2016 when it reached 90.7% household electrification level, a year earlier than its intended 90% household electrification goal by 2017. We have also included aspects of innovation in the way we energize our off-grid communities, specifically we are promoting the productive uses of renewable energy that not only ensures electrification of households in off-grid areas, but also mechanizes agricultural processes, which will help provide credible income-generating possibilities for our rural communities. Notable projects include solar-powered machines, such as a 2 kilowatt DC Abaca spindle machine installed in Sitio New Mabuhay in Davao Occidental, benefiting 136 households. 500 watts 24 DC corn sheller and 1200 watts corn miller in Sitio Mahaya, Davao Occidental, benefiting 104 households. Rice for uh, post harvest facilities in Siwasio. Uh, Sual Pangasinan, benefiting 37 households. These innovations are important and we plan to replicate and scale up these programs for widespread use and increase commercialization. Our goal now is to go beyond the vision of total electrification if we are to talk about inclusive growth and energy sustainability. We will now work on projects not only for technology demonstration, but should also demonstrate feasibility and at the same time increase economic activities for our far-flung communities. And to further promote innovative energy policies, Republic Act 11646 was issued by President Duterte on January 21, 2022 to promote the use of microgrid systems in unserved and underserved areas to accelerate the government's goal of total electrification in the country. A microgrid system is an integrated power generation and distribution system, whether or not connected to a distribution facility or a transmission facility. We have a project in Aborlan, Palawan, that provides a microgrid system for solar um, with battery for hundreds of households. And this could be integrated into the mainland Paleco, uh, Palawan Electric Cooperative for um, integrated, aggregated net metering in the future. Under the new policy, the installation of microgrid systems by microgrid service providers will be allowed to operate in areas where there is no electricity access or where power connection does not provide 24-7 electricity supply. 
It also creates a streamlined process for microgrid system providers with clear timelines and stiff sanctions for bureaucratic red tape and other delays. This year, the Department of Energy started works on the crafting of the draft rules and regulations implement, implementing Republic Act 11646 for the bidding of unserved and underserved areas to microgrid operators. Under the draft rules, the Department of Energy will open the identified underserved or unserved areas for competitive selection process to microgrid service providers. We will finalize the IRR by May 2022. To all participants of this activity, your presence in this forum is a clear manifestation of the importance that you and your respective organizations give to the significance of innovations in improving the lives of all Filipinos. We look forward to a productive and insightful discussion for all here. Thank you very much and mabuhay. Okay, uh, I'd like to thank uh, Secret Undersecretary Fontabella for sending that, and I understand that he may be able to join us later on for the discussion session. Uh, I hope so, but if not, that was very informative. Uh, Conrad, would you like to introduce our next speaker, please? Yes, uh, good morning uh, to everybody. Let me introduce the second speaker. His name is Tony Jose Layug. And he's the president of the developers of renewal, Renewable Energy for Advancement Incorporated. And he's currently a senior partner at uh, Puno, Puno Law Office. He's recently served as a chairman of the National Renewable Energy Board from 2016 to 2018. And was the undersecretary of the DOE from 2010 to 2012. He was primarily responsible for the revival of various sectors in the Philippine energy sector with the launching of the National Renewable Energy Program, the Philippine Energy Contracting Runs for Petroleum and Coal, and the Public Transport Assistance Program of Pantawid Pasada. Prior to joining the uh, prior to his stint at DOE, Jay was a senior counsel for the negotiations and legal department of the Australian Strategic Business Unit of Chevron Corporation. And he also was part of uh, Malampaya and from 2007 to 2010. And as Chevron Consul, he received the first ever William T. Coleman Award in 2008, the highest recognition given by, the, by Chevron Corporation to a Chevron in-house counsel. Before joining Chevron, Jay also acted as international legal consultant of the ADB and was a senior associate at CCIP Salazar Hernandez and Got My Tan, Handling Banking and Finance. Jay also practiced law in New York and worked as a foreign lawyer at Sullivan and Cromwell in New York. Now he serves as dean of the University of Makati School of Law and is a professor of law in that school. Currently, he teaches Philippine Project Development and Finance, Administrative and Law, and Local Government to law students since 2002 at the University of the Philippines College of Law. So, Mr. Layag, I would like to give the floor to you. To Good morning. Good morning, Conrad. Uh, good morning to everyone. Ben, good to see you again, uh, just like last time. Good, uh, good morning. Allow me to share my slides. And... Uh, I was told that I have a lot of time this time because uh, I think uh, aside from Charlie, uh, we will be sharing the minutes unused by uh, Yusek Wimpy. Anyway, good morning, everyone. Good to see again uh, all your followers at Manila Times online. And uh, I'd like to show you some slides and give you an update and overview of the renewable energy developments in the Philippines. Uh, the title is obviously appropriate for, for this uh, uh, webinar because uh, we're talking about the boost for the future of power in the Philippines and energy. So let me just show you where we are. It's always uh, nice to look at the current situation and the context. Um, this data came from the Department of Energy. Um, at this time, we have a total of 20, 26,286 megawatts installed capacity. Uh, these are power plants running on different fuel sources. So we have coal, we have the most coming from coal. 
we have oil-based plants, we have natural gas coming from Malambaya, and renewables. Now, in terms of um, dependable capacity, you will see here that it's a little lower. It's 23,410 megawatts. Now, is this where we are? Actually, no. If you look at the current numbers of available capacity in the Philippines, it's much lower than that number. And I'll show you why over the years that dependable capacity has gone down. In terms of renewables, um, lucky or not, no, uh, not because uh, we have not been able to put in more, but at least we have 7,653 megawatts coming from renewable energy resources. That's about 29% of the total installed capacity. And among the renewables, the most that cover RE right now are hydro plants, about 3,779 megawatts. We have a lot of geothermal, 1,928, but uh, I have to admit when I left government, we were number two, the second largest producer of geothermal. After I left, now we are down to number three. Indonesia has overtaken us. We have a lot of solar, thankfully, but obviously we can put in more. And uh, very few wind and biomass plants. Now, earlier I was uh, explaining that while we have 26,000 megawatts installed capacity, our available capacity is much lower than that. And this bar graph you will see explains that. If you look at the right-hand side, about 5,000 megawatts are power plants that had been operating in the Philippines for more than 20 years. That's why I've been saying, Houston, we have a problem. Because these are aging plants, we have seen for the last three years that the, there is an increase in forced outages of these power plants. In fact, for the last two years, the average of forced outages, meaning those that are unscheduled, those that suddenly break down, they have averaged to around 2,000 megawatts, particularly during summer months. And we're talking about now. We're talking about April and May. So because of the aging power plants, we note that, and with increase in demand for power, we have a problem because every summertime we suffer from these yellow and red alerts. This is a uh, data. This is data that came from the Department of Energy. They said on a worst case basis, if demand hits this much, you know, Houston, we have a problem. For the, months, for the months of April and May, you see in this diagram, yellow and red alerts anticipated. In fact, we have suffered for, from a couple of uh, yellow alerts uh, during the weekends in April when demand for power is even low. You know? So what does this tell us? Again, going back to the current supply mix you know, that we have, because our power plants are aging, particularly those coal plants, they've started to break down, you know, just like using old cars. And therefore, when they break down, we don't have enough supply. And demand for power, we all know during summer months, is just too high. And therefore, they are, the, demand, uh, the supply is not able to keep up with the demand. Hence, you see these yellow and red alerts. I hope in the next three weeks, it rains a bit. Because if it does not, then we will see these red alerts as anticipated. So let's see what happens. But so far, uh, we have seen definitely a spike in demand for power, especially since we are now back in our offices. And we are down to alert level one, where, where all offices, manufacturing plants, are back to their regular programming. So that means all, uh, all your demand for power is going up. Now, we have a lot of RE resources. We need not look far. We don't even need to consider other fuel sources. Uh, as I always say, renewables, you have the big show. Biomass, geothermal, solar, hydro, ocean, and wind resources. We have a lot of those. Unlike other countries, the Philippines is very lucky because we, have, we are abundant in these resources. And why do we want to push for more RE? Number one, they have now become very cheap compared to your conventional fuel. Your solar power supply agreements now have been approved by the ERC at a very low 3 pesos 50 centavos per kilowatt hour. 
Compare that to diesel fired plants, which are around 8 to 9 pesos. Probably it's even higher now with the oil prices going up. Number two, we are going to rely less on imported fuel resources. We're talking about coal and diesel. No? And then, of course, they, they being renewable, they never deplete. No? Because if obviously, if there's no more sun and wind and water, we're all going to die, right? So renewables never, never deplete. And we have not even counted the benefits from the environment. So all these are reasons why we should hike up our renewable energy targets. We tried that in 2010. In 2011, we launched the National Renewable Energy Program. I was still there in government. Back then, we had 5,400 megawatts of renewable energy installed capacity. And the target is by 20. 30, we said we will have 15,304 megawatts or an additional 10,000 megawatts in a span of 20 years. Now, there's a reason why we want to have more RE, as I mentioned. Aside from the ones that I mentioned, look at this data. We don't produce a lot of oil, hardly. We don't produce a lot of gas. In fact, they will, it, Malampaya will end in 2024. And definitely, we don't produce a lot of coal. In fact, the coal that we produce, China is even buying that from us, even if China is already the largest producer of coal. So you can imagine, if we have little resources, then we use our own indigenous energy resources. Those are the renewable energy targets. Now, ever since I left government, no, this is where we are through the years. No? And it's not data that uh, everyone should be smiling about. Why? In 20, 2009, 2010, in terms of installed capacity, as I had explained, we, were, we reached as high as 33, 34% renewable energy in the uh, supply mix. Now, after 10 years, it's down to 29%. That means we did not add too many renewable energy plants. And if I go to act power or energy actually generated, it's even worse. Renewables account only for 20.8% of generated energy in 2019. And look at coal. We are up to 54.6%. Houston, we have a problem here. This is not really good data. Why? We all know coal prices have been going up. In fact, the other day, I was not a happy camper. I used to pay uh, electricity bills at 15,000 a month. The other day, I saw my bill, it's now up to 25,000. Why? Because coal prices are up, oil prices are up. No? But we could have prevented that if we have more renewable energy in the installed capacity mix. We would have avoided that. Now, for the last 10 years, as I mentioned, unfortunately, we were able to add only 2,300 megawatts of new renewable energy capacities. That's not a lot in a 10-year period. We should have added more. No? But luckily, if you see here, there's a total of 221 uh, billion pesos actually invested in the Philippines for RE. Now, I just want to highlight a couple of points here. If you see when these power plants came on board and online, you look at those years, 2014, 2015, 2016. And then again, another spike in 2019. Now, let me explain why they built during these times. These are years when we implemented the feed-in tariff system. So what does this show us? The fit worked in the Philippines. The people, our investors built renewable energy plants under a fit regime. And it worked. So after that, we saw a lot of power plants getting installed. No? A total of additional 2,300 megawatts. But again, as I've said, it's not enough. No? After 10 years, we only built 2,300 megawatts. And unfortunately, based on our targets, we are way, way behind. No? And in fact, as a result of that, as I mentioned, more coal is being used now and diesel-fired plants our energy self-sufficiency as a consequence went down. We were importing less in 2008. That's why we were independent to the extent of 67%. But in 2019, with all coal plants and diesel plants 
uh, in the system, our energy self-sufficiency went down to 46%, meaning we have been importing more energy resources than in the past. So how about supply and, uh, supply and demand outlook? So I've shown you the supply situation. Demand, obviously, uh, Philippines is a growing economy, and therefore demand continues for power, continues to grow. In fact, on an average of 4.4% demand for power, this is what we need by 2040, an additional 43,000 megawatts. That's a lot to fill up, right? So we hope the next administration will convince more investors to come in. No? Not coal, not diesel, not oil, not bunker fuel, but more renewable energy plants. Now, let me just show you what has happened for the last three years. Remember, we were in a pandemic, 2020 and 2021. Before the pandemic, in 2019, our peak demand hit already 13,450 megawatts. But look at, obviously, in 2020, we all shut down. Everyone was stuck at home. Our peak demand went down and our demand for power went down. But look at 2021. We were still in a pandemic, right? But our peak demand was even higher than 2019 during a regular normal year. You can imagine this coming summer in 2022 when everyone is now on alert level one and we're all going to our offices, as I've said, peak demand will be higher than this. So we will now face another situation where our supply will not be able to keep up with that demand, especially during summer months. Um, I'm not going to belabor the issue on, on the matter of all the laws that we have. I think if there's one thing good about the Philippines, there are many lawyers. We have passed so many laws, no? but the challenge always is implementing them. Our renewable energy law is something to emulate because we have put in all the necessary incentives. I call them a buffet of incentives. We have fiscal incentives. A lot of them, it's a long list. No? Uh, I just want to focus on, for example, if you sell power running on renewables, that is zero-rated VAT. So you don't have the usual 12% VAT uh, that is imposed on conventional fuels. And then you have a special real property tax rate of 1.5% when it is usually 2%. And then, of course, you will, uh, you will get a seven-year income tax holiday, and after seven years, you only pay 10% corporate tax rate. So that's a lot of incentives. On the non-fiscal incentives, we also have a lot. No? Um, as I've said, our RE law is a combination of all good laws in other jurisdictions. So we also have the non-fiscal incentives, primarily the feed-in tariff system. We implemented this, as I showed earlier, in 2014, 15, and 16, and 2019, as a result of that, the government awarded fit rates to 1,400 megawatts of RE plants on different technologies. And let me just show you the impact of those fit plants. No, at that time, I remember people were the pundits were saying it's too expensive. On the contrary, no, ladies and gentlemen, the fit plants actually allowed you to save on your energy costs. This is as of January 2020. This can be easily updated by government. You know? As of January 2020, the FIT uh, avoided cost is 40.8 billion pesos. That means your electricity bills are cheaper by 9.4 centavos per kilowatt hour because the FIT plants displace the more expensive diesel plants and sometimes even the coal plants. You can imagine if we had put in more at lower rates, lower fit rates, then we will not be suffering from high electricity prices. And I ask government to update this. Believe me, this number will even go up because oil prices are at an all-time high lately. We have also the net metering program. I encourage all our households to put up uh, solar rooftop systems in your homes. You can avoid these high electricity prices. No? Of course, our desire, our our plea to government is please make it easier to install these via facilitating all the permits. We also have the RPS, the Renewable Portfolio Standards. This is a mandate by the government to all utilities that they should enter into power supply agreements with renewable energy resources. There's a formula for that. 
And based on the formula, these are all utilities. There is a market to build more renewable energy plants no? at cheaper rates, as I uh, mentioned earlier. Now, RPS applies not only in on-grid areas, RPS also applies in off-grid areas. Right now, uh, National Power Corporation has implemented hybrid solar diesel systems in off-grid areas which are cheaper than your usual bunker fuel or diesel generator sets that they used to um, apply in off-grid areas. So the RPS for off-grid is also there. And then we have the green energy Energy option program. I, I'm sure everyone has seen solar panels along the highway. No, the biggest right now that I've seen is the one of Alaska Milk Corporation. Kudos to them. They put up a six megawatt solar rooftop system in their plant, and I'm sure they're saving a lot of electricity cost. That is under the GEOP, which means if you are a consumer with at least 100 kilowatt demand, peak demand, you can enter into power supply agreement directly with a, an RE supplier without going through the utility. This has helped a lot of manufacturing plants, hospitals, uh, resorts, hotels, schools who have put up um, solar rooftop systems in their uh, respective buildings. Of course, we have the RE market currently in place. For every megawatt hour you generate, you will be given an RE certificate, which, which will be used as a form of compliance. And finally, we have the Green Energy Auction Program. If you ask me, this is the same dog with a different color. It's actually the FIT system. This, this should have done, been done way before. No? But nonetheless, we thank the DOE now that they implemented this last fe February. We're still waiting for ERC to come up with the final ceiling prices so that new renewable energy plants can get built at much lower ceiling prices. No? The solar, if you recall, solar fit was at 8.69 in 2012. The solar gear price right now was set by ERC at 3.62. You can imagine the rates have become low. The argument against renewable in 2010, 2011 uh, for being more expensive is already gone. We should not even talk about prices of RE. The government uh, plans to update the uh, renewable energy program and rep and from 35%, they want to increase it to 50%. We fully support this. We just may need to make sure that the laws are implemented properly and efficiently. So right now, with all the laws that you have, we have a lot of market for RE suppliers to come over. We just need to make sure that the government enables them. And we need to declare as a fundamental policy of the government that we should have preferential bias for cleaner forms of indigenous energy resources. Let's not talk about importing anymore. Not coal, not diesel, not nuclear. Let's push for more renewables. So you've seen all these players enter the market and hopefully someday we will not suffer from these high electricity prices. Back to you, Ben. Thank you. Okay, thank you, attorney. Uh, we'll, have a, we'll have a few things to talk about after uh, after our next speaker. Uh, Conrad, would you like to introduce our uh, third speaker for today? Oh, yes. Okay. I'll, thank you very much. But before I proceed with the next speaker, let me share some insights on Attorney Layug's uh, presentation. I think it's very timely because the Russia-Ukraine conflict clearly demonstrated that we can never be, I mean, dependent for majority of our power needs. And Fortunately, our next speaker has, uh, I would say, very viable solutions for that, for the country to achieve or to at least have, I mean, achieve a degree of uh, what I would call energy security or even energy dependence. His name is Charlie Aiko, and he's the chairman and president of Weijian Energy Philippines. He, uh, he became the youngest mayor in 1988 after serving as OIC mayor under uh, after being appoint, appointed by president corazon aquino in 1986 he left politics in 1992 and he became one of the central figures in the non-governmental organization movement in bohol and he and he uh, uh, applied or shared his expertise there in administration development and rural finance he was the founder and president of habitat for humanity in Agpagbilaran 
and becoming its uh, project director in, in 1999 and went on to, be, to become the chief executive ex officer of Habitat for Humanity Philippines. He's a product of the Ateneo de Manila University, as well as the Immaculate Heart of Seminary, a Mary Seminary in Pagbilaran City, Bohol. And he went on to earn his master's degree uh, in Asia at the Asian Institute of Management. Now he is the president of, uh, of uh, Weijian Laudati C and currently sits at the board of the Weijian group of companies. And I'm sure uh, he has very uh, many things to share with us because I had lunch with him, I think, uh, one week ago, and we talked extensively about his house being energy independent or no longer connected to the grid. And we'd also like to know more of that, Mr. Charlie Aiko. So, sir, the floor is yours. Good morning. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very, uh, very much, Conrad. Uh, let me share my screen. I hope uh, you can hear me right. Can you, you can see it. Okay, there it is. Thank you once again, and thank you for this uh, opportunity. And I'm very pleased that you organized this event because our discussion here will be very timely. Uh, and I'm also happy that I follow after the presentation of Jay because uh, I picked up a lot of things from his presentation. And one of the things that I, I, I picked up is when, when he said, we are in a very precarious situation because we are in a situation where we have low supply of electricity. And in fact, there is now red uh, signals there. And then we are getting a higher demand. So you already see that there is an imbalance. Then I would like to add, based on our experience, we now have a serious problem of energy security. And I experienced the disruption to our energy system. And I, I shared it to you, Conrad, when I spent Christmas in my home uh, city in Tagbilaran, Bohol, and we were hit by UDET. And it was a total system failure because when we lost our power, we cannot buy... Uh, uh, we cannot communicate with each other. All the gas stations uh, could not supply uh, fuel because they don't have uh, the pumping capacity. We wanted to buy food. Uh, we, when we pay money, we have no money because they, we cannot withdraw from the banks. The ATMs are offline. And we cannot also use our credit card. So you can see it is a sample of a, of a system failure. And we were reflecting and said, oh my God, if this happened to a small city like Wall, and it is already a huge problem, what would be the impact if it happens to a large city like Metro Manila? And then I thought that was a one-off experience. We went again to Bohol for the Holy Week. And Leite was hit by Agaton, Typhoon Agaton. We, are not connect, uh, we were not directly hit by that, but the connection, the submarine cables were affected. And so again, we lost power. And when we came back to Manila, what do we have? It is Russia's war uh, against Ukraine, where all of a sudden overnight of uh, prices of fuel increase tremendously. So we have direct experience of a disruption in our energy system. It could be just like the aging of our power plants, but it could be man-made. It could be or natural like a typhoon. So whereas before the discussion was more focused on environmental protection and climate change, I think we have to add more discussion in terms of energy security because that is a real problem that we are facing right now now if that is the why so we have we have to question we have to analyze what is our problem when when i look at our experience for example in udet and agaton one basic problem is our concentration risk which is inherent in how the grid is being organized and so when our submarine cable from Leyte was affected. We lost all the power. If a major power plant here, like the five gigawatts of power plant will be lost, then it affects the whole grid. And so the question is, how are you going to solve a problem like that? Well, I'll, I'll use an analogy. We had a problem with the transport sector. Too much traffic in EDSA. Uh, MRT was not uh, working very well. So what happened? It gave rise to uh, motorcycle services. It could be Ancas or Grab. So everybody, even if you improve, for example, the MRT, people still have to drive to the train station. 
to the MRT station, what are you going to use? We have no, no buses. So they are using now motorcycles. What is this? This is a decentralized solution. In other words, it's a complementary solution that supplies or tries to mitigate the impact of a centralized solution. So we have, I think, to think in those terms, is there a way in which we can mitigate the impact when there is failure on the grid? And what I believe is the solution is we should have a more decentralized system where people, as uh, mentioned by uh, Tony J earlier, we have to install solar. And this is what I experienced in Bohol. When we lost uh, power in Bohol for two months due to death, we installed solar and I switched off my grid, technically. Although I can switch it on, but I, I, I don't need it. I have a five kilowatt uh, installation there. I'm technically, uh, and I have uh, 9.6 kilowatt hours of battery. I'm free. I can use my aircon, use my uh, TV, refrigerators, no problem. Okay. The second risk that we are facing right now is our energy or fuel source risk. Uh, this is not the most updated uh, figure, but more or less, we are still like up to more than 70% or 80% of our energy source is based on imported fuel, either coal, uh, that is more than, more than 50%. The assumption before is we made the assumption that the supply of fuel from abroad is stable. But the war in Ukraine and Russia has just shown us that it could be disrupted as well. Especially when, for example, there was a problem between China and Australia, and China was buying all the coal, and then uh, all of a sudden Indonesia said, we are not exporting our coal. The advantage of diversifying, as, as Jay mentioned earlier, especially on renewable energy, and I'd like to focus on uh, solar and wind. In these technologies, you don't need additional inputs once you put up your solar plants or your uh, rooftop solar. So if, for example, this is the uh, uh, this shrimp farm in General Santos, this is a 700 kilowatt uh, solar powering the shrimp farm, it means that even if the cost of energy or the cost of diesel or the cost of coal will increase 200, 300 times, they are already covered or they are protected from that. Because they, this, the energy produced by these solar installations is already fixed. It will not fluctuate. The, the price of coal and fuel will always go up and down depending on the world market. But if you buy a solar installation, that's it. You just divide how much is the cost, what is to be produced over 25 years, and then you get your per kilowatt hour, which is maybe four pesos per kilowatt hour in 25 or 30 years. So the solution is get a source of energy in which once you have it, you don't need additional inputs from abroad. And a coal plant is not a solution because even if you add coal plants, you are dependent on the supply of coal plants from abroad, which you can only hope that it will be stable. Aside from, I'm not even talking about the environmental cost of doing that. So if this is what we can do, what we can do, therefore, is we have to decentralize, we have to diversify. The next question is, how are we going to do it? And in fact, it begs into the question that was there something or is there something that we can do to improve the approach so that we can build more renewable energy? As uh, Attorney Jay Lyon said, uh, we were not building a lot of renewable energy. So I, I was thinking about that. And I think one way of doing that is not to depend only. Let, let the national government do their job. Let them work with big energy suppliers. But what is very critical is you boost the role of LGUs on energy. What, what do I mean by this? Last January, there was a joint memorandum. This is last year, 2020, between the ILG and DOE. And what was that? Guidelines for LGUs to facilitate the implementation of energy projects. Why is the word facilitate used here? 
Because the experience was that many of the applications for power projects or renewable projects slowed down when they reached the LGUs. Either there could be additional requirements and, and things like those. And then facilitate also means that the old LGUs now are mandated to identify potential sources of renewable energy. So that there is a central data in which the private sector can, can go in. But aside from facilitating, the LGUs themselves can do it, can try to provide energy on their own. And on the right side here, I just show this is our record of the contract signing of our first local PPP between WeGen and a local government where we intend to install small system, 159 kilowatts on the municipal hall of the municipal Tubigon and also at the community hospital. So this is an example of a project, a renewable project for the LGU's own consumption. Okay, but at least it is small. It means that it reduces by that amount the total demand of power in Bohol. Multiply that X number of times, it means that's the extent to which we can bring down the, the total demand so that our supply, even if it is now low, it will try to match what is the demand. Because we cannot leave just the demand to continue to grow. We have to bring down the, the demand through the self-generation of power by consumers. At the smallest level, at the household level, I am producing 5 kilowatts in my house. This municipality is producing uh, 159 kilowatts. If you, again, if you multiply that into so many projects, then it becomes significant. Now, why is it not being done? And thank you, Conrad, for introducing me as a former mayor. It's a mindset issue. What do I mean by a mindset issue? Look at this. This is a record in 2018 at the PPP Center. This is a summary of PPP LGU projects. And look at the project. Baga Water Supply Project. Pampanga Bulk Water Supply Project. There's only one energy project. Quezon City Waste to Energy Project. Cagayan de Oro Septage, Cebu Solid Waste Management, and General Santos Public Market. Then, ask ourselves, why are the LGUs interested in water, but only one is talking about energy? Let me go back. I'll go to the local government code because all mayors, all local government units look at the local government code as their Bible. And what does the local government code say? First, the responsibility of the LGUs, the general welfare. Each local government unit shall exercise the powers okay, to promote general welfare in their respective territorial jurisdiction. So that is, and then enhance economic prosperity, preserve the comfort and convenience of their inhabitants. So in other words, that is the general statement. And then the next section up here, that section 17, mentions how are you going to do it? What are the basic facilities that you should do so that you can promote the general welfare of the people and enhance economic prosperity? Okay? First is, the mandate is all LGOs must endeavor to be self-reliant. So that is, that, that is the mandate. It's not that you should be dependent, but try to endeavor to be self-reliant. And then you have to work towards the efficient and effective provision of the basic services and facilities. And then after this is a long list of basic services and facilities. And what does the list include? Agricultural facilities, library, all of that. And then eight, infrastructure facilities intended primarily to service the needs of the residents of the municipality, specifically mentioning water supply systems and similar facilities. Nothing is mentioned about energy. But reflect about that. Therefore, any educated constituent, voter of that locality, if they have a problem of water, they will go to their mayor and ask, Mayor, help us solve our water problem. It is your responsibility. And so local government units either organize a water district, run their own municipal water system. If these are far flung houses, they distribute jetmatic projects, uh, spring development, water projects because local executives, local leaders recognize and own the problem. They know that they are accountable to provide basic service, and this is water and other services. What about power? Let's look at the problem of Mindoro. 
In 2019, there was a consultation, no less by the Secretary of the OE, to try to find a solution on the problem of Mindoro. Okay? 2019, until now, that problem has not been solved. But why did it take the OE, why does it take a national government to go there and solve the problem? Because again, the mindset of the local leaders is that whenever it is a power problem, that's the domain of the electric cooperatives of NEA of the DOE. They don't take accountability to that. And I think we have to change the narrative. If you go back to the general welfare, Go, go into the promotion of general welfare, enhance economic prosperity, preserve the comfort and convenience of their inhabitants, and it means there is no comfort and convenience. You cannot enhance economic prosperity if your local government unit has no power. They have to own that, and we have to boost, and we have to deliver that message to them. So... This is an example, as I mentioned, and this is the same thing that I experienced. This house installed a 5 kilowatt peak uh, system after UDEP. This is the only house in their barangay in Tagbilaran which has power for two months because the grid was down. And I, I live in another, my house is in another barangay, a similar system. When the grid returned, how much was our power? Our electric bill was only 35 pesos. This is our stuff, by the way. This, this is a battery. So, what I'm saying is that the local government units can promote this initiative. And there are various ways. If a local government can distribute jetmatic pumps and artesian wells, what is preventing the local government unit from distributing through a loan arrangement, either a grant or a loan, a, a lease purchase agreement, or components for a solar system so that he ensures that their municipality has adequate and efficient power system. I think, again, it is that the, the laws are there, the powers are there, it is more in the consciousness and the mechanism on how to do that. So I was thinking now, in terms of technology, there's no problem. There are now, uh, we, we always say, oh, battery is expensive. The latest technology of Enphase is IQ8, which is a grid-forming microinverter, meaning it can operate even without battery. And it will not give an export. There's a zero export because it is run by software. The only challenge that we have now is the demand for their products in Europe increased by 300% because of the, of the threat of losing their power source from Russia. And so we are, we are just the second, second, small secondary market for them. We have to fight. But in terms of technology, it is now very, very affordable. And we are about to install 15 uh, pilot installations in eight municipalities and uh, seven churches in Oriental Mindoro to show to the people how it is done, how do you scale it up, what is the base investment, how do you recover your investment. And so these are some of the business models. In, in uh, The LGU, for example, can borrow from the Development Bank of the Philippines or Land Bank, uh, DBP, I mentioned DBP because they have a special uh, loan facility. It's called the E2C. And they only charge 5.5% per annum of interest, secured partly by IRA. Meaning, partly meaning what is secured is only the uh, payable in, one, uh, in, let's say, one quarter. And the LGU can supply its own installations and it will use its savings to pay for the system. And once it is fully paid, it is practically energy independent for, the, for so many years, for 25, 30, 40 years. And then the private sector like Wigen, we can just enter into a, a bidding or a bill transfer and operate mode. Now, but this is for the LGU, for their own hospital, for their own public market, uh, uh, municipal hall. What about the constituents? This is the model, and I'm looking at two models. One is they borrow from the bank and uses their, the, the loan proceeds to give a material loan with labor counterpart for their constituents, and then they collect monthly. And then uh, private sector can provide a quality services or quality materials to the constituents who want to buy. 
Yes. But I talked to some mayors and they said, you know what, we are politicians. We will have a hard time collecting from our voters. So we thought of another model. And under the local government code, the LGU is allowed to give a loan or even a grant to a local NGO or multipurpose cooperative. So they can do wholesale loan here. And then their wholesale loan, the proceeds will be relent to a multipurpose cooperative, which is responsible for doing retail lending. So the LGU is actually uh, protected from directly dealing with their constituents and then the private sector can come in. Or the multipurpose cooperatives can directly borrow from that. But what is important here is to encourage them and to prevent, uh, uh, to make sure that the process is easy for them to do. And for DOE to encourage that. And I like very much what uh, Attorney Jay mentioned about FIT. Because FIT is a very important component. But let us not limit FIT to large installations. You can just imagine if I install 5 kilowatts in my house, and then I only consume 2 kilowatts of that, I can provide 5 kilowatts as a fee, then I have, I have a guaranteed fee. I can easily recover. Believe me, believe me, just like what happened in Vietnam, where they were able to get uh, a beach up to, I think, 9 gigawatts in one month under a rooftop fit. We can easily do that. It is just changing the way we approach this. There is a central approach. There is a decentralized approach being initiated through local government units. The last picture is a mini hydroelectric plant in my hometown. This is a joint venture between the municipality of Sibilia and Bohekuan. I showed that picture because the original purpose of this was for the municipality of Sevilla to have its own source of power so that it will have a stable source of power. Unfortunately, because this is not a wholly owned hydroelectric plant by the cooperative, they cannot directly sell the power to the municipality. They have to bid it out to other players. And so the power produced by the hydroelectric plant could be used even in Luzon because we are part of the grid. But the municipality needs stable and uh, 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 available power, and the source is right there. So I think we have to think also of how do we balance the need of a national grid with the need of a local source? Because we cannot become self-reliant if we are prevented from using our own resources, especially high, mini hydro and also small solar installations. So thank you very much uh, for that, and thank you very much. And I look forward to a lot of opportunities in the future uh, on the energy sector. Thank you. Oh, okay, thank you for that, Charlie. Um, and uh, that was uh, that was very insightful. Um, now I see what you were talking about earlier when uh, you know I had suggested a couple of topics um, that was actually the kind of stuff I'm looking for. But I have a bunch of questions for both you and Attorney Jay. So um, if you don't mind, though, uh, um, I, I want to ask Attorney Jay first. Um, the one of the one of the areas uh, one of the areas that I've been uh, uh, keeping an interest in um, in the in the power sector is the energy market. Um, and, and they have a they have a market now for renewables after a fashion. Um, what what other? Uh, um, I I have an answer in my head for this, but I want to hear what you think. What other um, improvements could they make for the you know make to the way the energy markets work, um, particularly to avoid the kind of situation that uh, that uh, Charlie was talking about just there at the end of his uh, presentation, where um, the the way the market structure is is it 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 there are so many you know, there, there are so many steps to it. Um, you know, is there is there a way to is there a way to to, to streamline things and to um, you know get uh, get more players involved in it? Um, actually, Ben, I always answer that with one letter G: government. No? Um, again, we go back to all these discussions, not just here in the public forum, but in Senate committee hearings, in the House committee hearings. 
why is it so hard to build a power plant? Um, if you ask me how many signatures do you need to secure to operate a power plant, build from scratch all the way to commercial operations, 200. And if I go to the alphabet from A to Z, there's a government agency involved. Now you need to secure secure a service contract from the DOE. You need to secure a, the consent from the NCIP. You need to secure land conversion from DAR. You need to secure so many other things. No? Um, and they are not in one place. And that's the reason why Santo Wingo Chalian uh, pushed for the EVOS law, the electric uh, um, uh, virtual one-stop shop, the energy virtual one-stop shop, where all government agencies should follow join in that online platform system and just allow all these uh, RE developers to submit their applications online. And guess what? Since 2019, that law was passed, only two government agencies are in there, the DOE and uh, I think uh, DNR is already there. No? Um, we have so many laws. It's not a, Laws are not the problem. The problem is always implementing them. No? Uh, another point, why is it that we are in this situation where not too many RE plants were built? No? I go back to the competitive selection process, the CSP rules. We should have allowed utilities to easily post and publish requirements for their CSP requirements purely on renewable energy. For the last four years, we have not allowed that. It's only recently that finally the DOE said, okay, you can go out for public bidding purely on renewables. But then it takes so long to even approve the posting for notice for a CSP. So quite frustrating. And, and I'm frustrated because, again, I paid 25,000 pesos on my electricity bill no, last, last month. No? And because the prices spiked and they spiked because again we're relying heavily on coal and still on oil no we could have prevented that if we put in more renewable energy systems so it starts from government be an enabler no don't create barriers so that we will allow more re developers to put up more power plants okay um i'm gonna uh, i want to i want to switch gears uh, um a bit, um, but but keeping but keeping on the uh, keeping on the theme of government, um, I, I just I, I was really uh, Charlie, I was really kind of uh, flabbergasted by by what you uh, were pointing out about um, the LGU's focus. There is does it does it really come down to a matter of? You know, they focus on water systems because that's what is specifically written in the local government code. I mean, is it that simple? You know, that that if if we were to go back and amend the local government code and add in, you know, a couple of words in that sentence, you know, energy systems, that that may solve the problem? It's, uh, it's more than that. It's not only one line. Uh, it's a consciousness. Uh, there is a consciousness, I don't know, or, uh, maybe inadvertently developed, that whenever it is a power problem, it is the DOE which will solve that, it is NEA which will solve that, it is the electric cooperative which will solve that. Because, why? Because their understanding of the power system is it is a one huge grid system that if I, if my municipality has some barangays with no power, it's a matter of putting extension wires into that. And then if the electric cooperative would say, wait, why is it that we have a brownout? The electric cooperative would either say, oh, either because there's a problem with NGCP in the transmission, uh -huh. or there is insufficient supply. And so the, the, the question always is, again, the consciousness and, and, and knowledge to ask, what can I do as a local government to solve it, which is within the law? Okay, I, I posed a question one time, I asked my, my staff a lawyer, I said, could you check it out? 
whether local government units are allowed to develop their own power plants. Okay? And, and the response that we have is, sir, there is uh, no specific prohibition. So I, I, I don't know. It was just a question of thing. But what we're offering is, what can, and, and this is what my message to the, to the mayors when I was in, in Oriental Mindoro. My question is this. Okay, let's not complicate the law. Let's simplify the question. What can you do as a mayor which is legal, okay, that will help solve the problem of energy in your locality. And my answer is, the quickest answer that I can get is you have to install your own solar installation for your own self-consumption. Because there is no, no, no brainer. You are allowed to do that. Okay? You can even sell the excess electricity to do that. So, the next question now is, okay, if the municipal government, like the municipality of Tubigon that I mentioned to you, can do that, the next question is, what can the next, that business uh, next to the municipal hall or that residential, what can they do? Of course, they can also install their own solar, but the greatest barrier to entry to them is the high initial investment cost. Mm -hmm. And so you have to capacitate them, you have to assist them in doing that. I, 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 I always use analogies. What does a local government unit do whenever the problems are farming because they don't have carabaos? The local government unit buys tractors and then lease them out to uh, to their constituents so that they can produce. Okay, what does the local government do when there are uh, micro businesses which cannot afford to have their own building? Well, they build a public market, lease the space so that they can do their own business. By the same token, they can buy in bulk components of a solar energy system and then lease it out to their constituents so that their constituents will become more energy, energy dependent. I think I, I reversed the process then from a very, very small uh, approach, which is uh, within their control. And the next level maybe is the one that I showed you. Can they now develop or co-develop their own local sources of energy for that? But I, I could imagine that if most of uh, of the of the houses in the locality, I, I, by the way, I one time I talked to the manager of all electric cooperative one. I said, "What's your total demand?" He said, uh, "Charlie, maybe around uh, we we are uh, around thirty megawatts." Okay, fine. How many customers do you have? I said, sixty. Okay. I said, "Do you realize that you just have to convince?" 50% or 30,000 of your customers to install one kilowatt peak on the roof, okay? And then you have already supplied your, your total need. And so the whole question is, who will, how do you structure that? Is it a loan to their customers? Is it your own investment as a local cooperative where you are just leasing the roof? You know, it's now a question of a financial structure, but the technical solution is there. That the, the way is not necessarily a, a centralized solution, but they can spread out the, the solution. No? But mm -hmm. it starts with the consciousness uh, for them. Okay. All right. Uh, I'm going to uh, I'm going to give Conrad a chance to jump in here. I think he has a few questions, and then uh, there's after that uh, there, there's a couple of interesting questions that have come from our audience. So, uh, Conrad, uh, go ahead. Yeah, thank you, Ben. Okay, uh, we I I uh, I realized or even years back that I mean I've been asking the question as to why coal is so very much entrenched in the Philippines. I mean the coal plants. Uh, let me ask a very sensitive question. Although I'm sure that uh, I mean you've heard this before. Is there such a thing as a coal cartel in the Philippines? I mean. <laughs> Yeah, any of you could answer that? <laughs> um, I, I'll, I'll, I'll answer that, Conrad. I don't think there's a cartel. Um, you know, our um, electric power industry has been, uh, in terms of ownership, has been dispersed well enough, uh, thanks to the APRA law. But certainly there is a lobby, uh, whether it's a coal lobby, a renewable energy lobby, a nuclear lobby, you know, um, of course, there will always be people lobbying, right? At the end of the day, however, and this is what I said to, um, 
to set a win Gachalian yesterday. I'm hoping, and because he's going back anyway to the Senate, I'm hoping that the future appoint appointees at the energy industry departments, whether it's the DOE, ERC, NTC, PNOC, are people of competence, okay. people who are independent, people who are broad-minded enough to listen to all lobbies, not just one. You see, the problem earlier is that people were saying, of course, when you hear whispers from everyone, that they say coal is cheap compared to renewables. So they listen, right? But look at what happened now, no? Four years, five years later, where where is your coal now? You're more than $300 uh, per metric ton. It used to be 60 last year, right? And then where are we on the oil? Um, that's exactly what's going on. No? We always put in all these imported uh, f- uh, power plants on imported fuels, and they always keep saying renewables are expensive. No, they're not. No? In fact, I keep asking those people who debated with me in 2011 at the Senate, where are you now? You know, uh, you pushed hard against renewables back then. Look at where we are now, 10 years later. I'm paying more. You are paying more, right? But, but renewable energy costs right now, solar is down to 350. Wind is down to 350. I've seen a proposal to Meralco at 345, in fact. Uh, biomass is down to what, five? Uh, so all these renewable energy technologies are lower now in costs. We could have had them. In fact, two years ago, there was a proposal to put up the largest wind farm in the Philippines at 182. But the DOE stopped it on the premise that there, was no, there were no rules for it. Uh, we could have had that solar uh, wind farm now and avoid and minimize these spikes no? because they could take over. Right? But uh, again... Of course, we always feel frustrated about it. At the end of the day, people will lobby. But your hope is a set of government officials who will listen to all lobbies and make a very informed and very intelligent decision, particularly on policies to be implemented. Okay, thank you very much for that. Now, I think uh, let me ask uh, one question. from uh, that's, a very, that's a very good answer, Mr. Lai, at least... Uh, uh, that answers the nagging question among some members of the media as to whether there is indeed a, a coal cartel. Thank you very much for your answer. Now, uh, let me ask one question from one of our audiences. Uh, from a certain Aaron Russell, he's asking how much is the capital outlay to, to supply 15,000 households of renewable energy in, uh, in a certain uh, area? Uh, I think uh, he said he prefers solar energy. So uh, I'm sure, Charlie, you could answer that question. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> the, the pricing of solar is parang ano yan, eh? parang cell phone. <laughs> okay. Merong very high quality solar system and then there's uh, low quality. I'll talk about maybe a relatively high quality. And the reason is my our, our, our criteria is, number one, reliability. Meaning, uh, it, it will really produce, uh, and uh, meaning it will not fail. And number two is safety, uh, meaning any danger about uh, fire and all of that uh, is uh, uh, it, it, it has been mitigated. The most common is if you don't put a battery, the range of cost of that will be between. 60,000 to the maximum of maybe 80,000 pesos per kilowatt peak. That, that is the range, depending, depending on what, what kind of system. So when you say 15,000, okay, if you only put one kilowatt, that's 15,000 times minimum of 60,000. Okay, that is the initial investment. But the most common is if you pay, uh, the, the ratio is for every kilowatt, that's equivalent to the normal of 1,000 pesos per month that you pay to Meralco. So if your average uh, consumption, uh, if you're paying 2,000 pesos uh, per month to Meralco, uh, you should install at least two kilowatts. Now, if J before uh, the, the monthly was 15,000, uh, I can immediately guess that what he needs is around 15 kilowatts uh, installation. That's without battery. Now, if you want battery, it would increase. It depends on the type of battery. 
if your battery is like i i don't recommend lead acid because of uh, the environmental uh, the problem of disposal but at least if you use a gel type it would last you around maybe three to four years but if you use a, a lithium iron uh, phosphate it would last you between 16 to 20 years or even more than that depending on, on, on how you protect it. And your price will increase from 60 to 80,000. It will be around 110 to as high as 150,000 per kilowatt hour. But think about this. If you finance it, like financing a car, you know, when we, when we buy a car, we, we pay it for uh, five years maximum. Okay, so if I, I'll use Jay's example. If Jay is paying 15,000, for a car, okay? And then we will install solar with battery. Most likely, what he will spend per month is around, I would say, 20 or 25,000 J, okay? But that is only for five years. After five years, zero, you know? <laughs> After that, that that's, and then you, you, you run that. The 25 years is just a warranty period. That's a warranty. But the life of the of a solar panel, the, the oldest that we have seen on record is already around 40 years old. Because the warranty of the solar panel is after 25 years, it will still produce at least 80% of the, its capacity. So if the, the, the capacity of the solar panel is 1,000 watts, it is still 8,800 watts after 25 years. And then after 50 years, theoretically, it's still uh, 60%. So in terms of return of investment, there's, there's no question about that. The barrier always is customers, just like selling a car or any customer goods. If you ask them, okay, buy this car, even if it is only worth 500 or 600,000 pesos, but you can only buy it in cash, they will not have a sales. And that's why if you shift that, uh, in our large projects, like when you do megawatt size or a 100 megawatt solar farm, the financing there would be most likely a PPA for 20, 25 years. But if you go into house uh, projects, it's better uh, approach as a consumer financing. Maybe you, you have five years and after that, uh, you are already free. So that's just the ratio that you can play with. And then uh, that's also how people. Now, by the way, in terms of return, okay, how much can you save? Even if you install one kilowatt for power, how the, uh, if, you, if you look at the electricity, electricity saved in one year versus your initial investment, your return or the savings would be around between 14 to 18%, depending on the value of the kilowatt. So in other words, if you spend 1,000, it will give you a savings of between 14 to 18% of that. Now, if that money is available to you and you put it in a bank, it will not give you even 3% in a year. So there's no brainer in terms of what is the best use of your money if your money is available. It's better to invest it in an asset which produces something or savings from you rather than having it sit idle somewhere in, in the bank. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Charlie. Yeah, very informative. So, Ben, do you have any more? Yeah, questions? Um, I, I do. I have one question of my own, but uh, a, a question just popped up from uh, somebody watching on, on Facebook right now. Um, so, I'll ask that one first. Um, this is from Gene uh, Glaponio. And he asked, who is a good resource to discuss the possibility of using my property for the purpose of building a mini solar grid? Um, and I would, I would suggest you're probably looking at him right here. Um, but um, do, do you guys uh, uh, have, any, uh, have any advice for somebody to say, okay, I have a piece of property, you know, I, wanna, I want to... Uh, install some solar um where should they start um what what's a, what's the first what's the first steps for for something like that i think uh, probably people would be interested to, interested to know that yeah um let me give some suggestions uh ben for a utility scale solar farm usually it's at around 50 megawatts that's uh the smallest capacity at which you can make a solar project uh, economically feasible. 
uh, you would need at least 50 hectares of land. So if, if he has that 50 hectares of land, uh, he can reach out uh, and I can give him some pointers and introduce him to some developers. However, if we're talking about small uh, space, no? Uh, that's not really for utility scale. Um, it, it depends on how big his uh, land area is. I've seen as small as one megawatt, so that means one hectare, uh, but only because that is developed because beside that lot is the off-taker itself, the buyer, uh, which is, for example, a cement plant uh, building its own two megawatt uh, small plant. No, um, so it depends on the size of his property, but at the very minimum, uh, if you want to make it a utility scale project, 50 hectares is what you need. Uh, if it's very small, you can just put up a solar system for own use only, uh, for your own consumption. But if it's around one to two hectares, he needs to check what's around him, if anyone can buy that power near his place. Okay. Then if I may add... <clears throat> Uh, the, the, the one challenge that uh, Jay mentioned was actually land conversion. If you have 50 hectares and it happens to be agricultural, you, you, that, that's the first challenge that you have. I, I came from the housing sector, so I know what it takes to, to do conversion. It's, it's very difficult. Now, mm -hmm. the second one is our company, WeGen, we are not into uh, utility scale. We are not into uh, ground mounted. And the reason is economics. You know, and, and not many people are aware because, because we have been approached also. And they would say, hey, I have a piece of property and I, I put solar panels in there. Now, if you go into a, a utility scale project, like even if you have 50 hectares, okay? Uh, and, and as Jay mentioned, if you have a one hectare, and then the off taker is beside you. It's a very different thing because when you are on a utility scale, you are competing against the wholesale price of power. So mm -hmm. you are competing against coal, you are competing. So you are forced to go down to what? 350, 4 pesos and all of that. Okay? Because the, the grid or the utility still has to sell that, to distribute that power to the consumer. So on the part of the consumer, when it reaches the consumer, it's already 10 pesos per kilowatt hour. Although the source from, from the solar was maybe 350 or 4 pesos. You add to that distribution, uh, systems loss, uh, NGCP and all of that. When you go into self-consumption, the economics is very different. You are competing against the retail price. So if the consumer is paying 10 pesos and then you put a small, let us say even 100 kilowatt, uh, on a property beside uh, that uh, that facility, and you say, this is for your own self-consumption. You own this, you buy this whole thing, or if they own your land, you, you put it in your own thing. So they would say, how much is that? Well, we are going to sell you the system, and if you divide the buying price with the generation capacity here, maybe it would translate to 6 or 650 per kilowatt hour. So that's 35% savings from the retail price. Whereas on the other one, uh, you, you are competing against 350. So th th the economics is very different. Uh, they have to be conscious of that. Mm -hmm. Right, okay. Um, I, just want to, uh, I just want to share something here. Um, uh, no, it's, I still have a question for both of you, and I think it's an important one, but I want to share something here. This is from Jenny of SunSmart, who's our, our, uh, um, our partner today. It, uh, it, she's, not, uh, she's not here with us, but she sends along a, a comment um, that we must be adaptive for per on potential solutions that are available. If many youth are watching, they will not understand this, that Prior to crafting the laws and even strategizing implementation, there should be awareness and know-how. Um, I think she's, you know, talking about the the technology, you know, and and the uh, the options in particular. And I think that's a good point. Um, and it might go back to what you said earlier about the mindset. Um, you know, in local government officials, uh, I just think a lot of people are not. They, they are not really aware, aware that, you know, that there is so much more that can be done than just buying your power from Moralco or from the local cooperative. Um, 
you know, and so that that's a very good point. I'm glad she shared that. What um what I want to uh what I want to ask both of you, and you can take turns at this, and uh if you could be specific, um that's that's what I'm looking for. In about about two months time, we're going to install a new administration. And without getting into the you know any kind of political thing, what what would you uh, let's think about like the, the first hundred days? You know, is always a it, it is always a kind of a kind of a benchmark. What would you like to see in terms of energy policy, and particularly in terms of supporting renewable energy? What do you think that the new administration, whoever it is? needs to needs to get accomplished within that first hundred days or at least very soon you know which what's on the top of the list um charlie you go first okay what i'd like to see i i call it the new green energy revolution i just coined the program it's a green energy revolution which is patterned after how the massive rural electrification program was done before. Meaning, it is a huge national program which will encourage all local stakeholders, especially the local government units and homeowners and small businesses, to install small solar systems, preferably hybrid, on their rooftops for self-consumption. Okay? And then DBP and land bank shall provide wholesale loan either to the local government units or multi-purpose cooperatives so that the constituents, the people in the barangays, in the municipalities can borrow, let us say, half a million, 300,000 pesos, 200,000 pesos to install the solar panels. The next question is, who will install? When the massive rural electrification was done, the National Power Corporation was tasked to train rural electric uh, electricians. These are the installers. I, I remember that very well because my father was one of the trainers. Uh, he was working with the National Power Corporation. So they, they went around uh, the countries, the National Power Corporation at the time. They had, they had the network. They trained uh, uh, home installers. And it is easy. Can it be done? Yes. Based on our experience in WeJet, we were able to train fishermen coming from the island of Pamilakan to become solar installers. There were seven of them. We only need one engineer, one electrician to supervise them, but they can do the installation because you have to multiply significantly the, the human resource available. The third is there must be a type of, maybe from DTI, type of certification that the package for to be installed meets quality standards because the danger now for example many of the do-it-yourself system they don't have the quality standards we have to make sure this is these are small power plants being installed on rooftops so that, that the safety requirements must be there the quality control must be there so it's a massive and, and i call it nothing less than a green energy revolution Okay, uh, Attorney Jay, how about you? Uh, ben, 100 days. First thing to do for the Energy Secretary is to announce to the whole universe that the Philippines prefers renewables. Not nuclear, not coal. Just declare that as a fundamental policy of the government. Next, in the next 100 days, unlock all those projects that are delayed because of permitting issues whether they are LGU issues or permits from other government agencies, unlock them. Only the Energy Secretary can do that. Number three, go out and make sure that uh, in terms of processes, particularly in putting up uh, transmission line infrastructure, coordinate with ERC and make sure that all decisions that need to be made to allow our utilities, NGCP, um, and electric cooperatives to um, upgrade their systems to ensure that all power plants uh, generation can be transmitted through the wires will happen because we've seen some uh, 
delays in government uh, regulations, uh, approvals in these uh, problems. So these should be the, you know, the top three um, and everything else will follow suit. No? If developers will see that it's so easier to do business in the Philippines with all these permits being facilitated no less than by the energy secretary himself, then Houston, we will not have any more problems. Okay, um, I, I want to, um, I, I, something that I've been thinking about for a while, uh, would it be good if, um, now the, the current, uh, the current national energy roadmap, you know, has, a, has, has the, uh, I forget what the exact figure is, I, I'm, you might have it right off the top of your head, but we're going to put X number of megawatts of renewable energy into the energy mix. Could they just do away with that limit? And and um, and say yeah well, okay we're going to build as much renewable energy as we can build because I know uh, I've I've discussed this uh, in, in my column. Uh, a few months ago, maybe uh, with some research I did. If you actually overbuild solar, there is an economic advantage to that. So that you know, placing a limit on oh well, we're only going to you know we're going to try to build this much this much renewable energy but you know that that also you know the flip side of that is we're not going to build any more than that should they just drop the limit say just just renewable energy you know as as much as we can handle uh I, i'm with you there ben just uh put up uh, all these uh re plants i think the the renewable energy program is there the numbers are there only for purposes of targets no mm-hmm. these are aspirations they're not really limits um, but and as I explained, even with the limits, we're so far behind, right? Uh, we set a 10,000 uh, megawatt target, and we only have 2,500. Right, right. And there and and there and there are some limits, though. I mean, you know, they, they, they well, they have been in the past. Um, you know, they'll they'll, they'll impose a. Um, I, I know the net metering was. You know, was one area where there was like, okay, well, it's going to, we're going to allow up to this much. And, and there seemed to be no clear reason why it should stop there. You know, so I think that's what, yeah, yeah, I, I agree. It's an aspiration, but I think, and that goes to the, maybe to the mindset problem that Charlie was talking about earlier. You know, the aspiration is also kind of seen as a ceiling. And I, you know, I think it gets reflected in the policy, not only in the policy, but in the, in the, uh, the, the process, you know, that, that gets developed and slows things down. Um, I think Conrad has another question. You want to, you want to go ahead there, Conrad? Yes. Uh, we've been pushing for, uh, in the shift to solar energy. And I know for a fact that the parts for a solar energy, energy system or even for uh, other types of uh, new energy systems are not really that complex compared to, say, diesel engines. So my question is that, is there a need to also encourage investments into the manufacture or the local manufacture of components for renewable energy systems? Because as we make this massive shift towards renewable energy, I'm sure there will be a need for, you know, what to, to have more solar panels. And I think uh, why don't we just uh, produce them here also, so that we can also, uh, you know, what uh, generate jobs from the manufacture of such systems? So I'd like to get your views on that. Um, actually, Conrad, no, go sorry, go ahead, Charlie. No, no. My 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 take on that is, uh, of course, we would be very very happy if there is local manufacturing because there is less dependency right now uh, we are very dependent on, on china and uh, if there's a problem with our supply chain in china then we are all affected the other backup is we have india but we have not really explored a lot about india but if we can have we cannot have self-sufficiency if we do not go into all the way from from manufacturing but it all goes the way to economics i hope there will be some incentives uh, i was about to add uh, conrad uh under the RE law, in fact, there are incentives for local manufacturers of RE system. Okay. No? Uh, but the barrier uh, to that is really the scale. Mm. Now, in other words, you would only put up manufacturing plants if you see that a lot uh, will get built. Um, and we have not seen that scale. No? But, you know, I'm, I'm very hopeful, for example, no? um, I, again, it goes back to, to issues in government governance. LLDA 
posted a public uh, auction for 2,000 hectares. That's 2,000 megawatts. You know, kudos to LLDA. They, they went ahead. No? The rules were transparent. The bidding was transparent. And then here comes an investigation from the House questioning the procedure, right? When we were all there, we saw it. How, except that there was a loser who complained, and now he said he should get it. No? And, and that's precisely when developers get frustrated because the system was transparent. Here comes a complaint, right? But aside from uh, you know um, floating solar, the Philippines now is has a, lot, a bright future for offshore wind because the World Bank just uh, published its report. I was part of that team that wrote the uh, regime for, for World Bank. And uh, there's so much scale for offshore wind. A service contract is about 500 megawatts each. You know? uh, in Europe, you see capacities, one project at 1,000 megawatts. So now we have a good alternative to coal plants because always the argument against renewables is they're very small, right? But now with offshore wind and the expectation and it's around in, in five years' time, they will be very competitive. We can replace all these coal plants in the future you know, with more renewables in place. Conrad, if, if I may add, yeah, sure. there's one thing that maybe we, we, we have not discussed. It's like this. We have at least, we have a limited hydroelectric power plants, but the existing are, are huge. So if, if you think about all the hydroelectric power plants, uh, Amboklao, uh, Agos, and all of that, Lanao Lake, in effect, is a huge storage. Okay, if so, I I, I don't know how uh, what's the product. I, I I'm just guessing. Like if Agos, the whole system is around 300 megawatts, if I'm not mistaken, or more. Okay, you can theoretically put up a 300 megawatt solar installations all over Mindanao to replace the output of Agus during daytime and save all that water in Lanao Lake, which is so huge anyway. And then once the solar goes down late in the day, then that's the time you release Agus. And you can do that with all of our dams all over the Philippines. So in reality, we can actually almost double uh, the capacity of our hydro plants in the Philippines by just pairing it with solar and using their dams as a storage. It's like a pub storage or something. You know, so we, uh, that's one way. And then how do you put it, whether it is one big solar farm? I'm still advocating that it will be so many, many small installations on the rooftops so that the people themselves can benefit directly from the business. Okay. Um, that's, that's interesting you just mentioned that because I had that I, I had that very idea because pumped storage is you know for bigger solar installations that's one of the you know one of the things that people are taking a look at to get over the problem of solar doesn't work at night um, and the, why don't you just fl float this float the solar on the reservoirs and we're always worried about the reservoirs not having enough water in them well if you're not using them for half of the 24 hours you're gonna you're gonna do okay um, I just wanted to ask one more quick question uh, before we wrap up and then and uh, I, I, I think this might be a good idea and maybe something that, that you could suggest, but you were talking about quality standards for the, for, for the solar equipment. Um, and I, I'm wondering, could the DTI, you know, get a jump on that and, and actually certify, make up, you know, get the standards together and certify certain sources of them right away so that you know you don't so i have a place i want to get a solar installation well i'd probably come to you or i'd talk to jenny but you know i know who to but i i say i don't know where i'm going i don't know anything about it so i just go looking around for a solar you know supplier and then you know i have to get it approved or whatever you know for this installation could is there a way to streamline that process and in the process dti could could you know help promote especially the local distributors and you know, local manufacturers once we start getting some more of them um so i i, I think uh well, 
I, I, I don't know all the legal side of it, but thinking, I think it can easily be done by DTI to make sure that the, the components is of high quality. The other one that I am also concerned is the installation itself. Because uh -huh. even if you have the correct component, it must be installed correctly. And uh -huh. I think what the LGU would just require is so that the, there is a permit. After the installation, there must be a signature from a licensed uh, electrical engineer certifying that the correct... Right. That would be, I, I think that would be fine. Okay. Um, Conrad, uh, in, any, any last words? And uh, perhaps you want to mention our sponsors again? Yes, uh, this has been a very fruitful uh, discussion, and we could go on, in fact. Uh, but we have other things to do, and I'm, sure, and I'm very sure that this won't be the last one. We will be meeting and discussing a lot of vital issues, especially on renewable energy. So let me mention our sponsors, our co-presenter, Regen Energy Philippines, sponsor. Thank you very much to the National Grid Corporation of the Philippines. And let me mention our special partner, SunSmart and our organization partners, the British Chamber of Commerce in the Philippines, Cebu Chamber of Commerce, the French Chamber of Commerce, the Davao Chamber of Commerce, the Financial Executives Institute of the Philippines, or Finex, Italian Chamber of Commerce of the Philippines, Management Association of the Philippines, or MAP, Nordic Chamber of Commerce in the Philippines, Philippine Center for Islam and Democracy, and She Talks Peace. So, Sir Ben, uh, we'll wrap it up now. And uh, we would like to thank our uh, speakers, uh, Yusek Fuentebella, Attorney Layug, and Mr. Charlie Aiko. Yes, uh, yeah, thanks. It's always a pleasure to, to have you guys uh, have you guys join us. And yeah, of course, we could go at this all day. Um, but uh, yeah, it's the weekend. And I think everybody wants to wants to go and do that. And uh, ruefully, uh, I need to go and pay my Moralco bill, uh, which is going <laughs> to, which is going to sting a little worse than I, and like you, Attorney Jay, mine, uh, mine is about 25% higher than it was last month. Um, it's it's going to sting a little harder after this discussion than it otherwise might have. But uh, there's there's hope for the future, I think. Um, and I'd like to thank everybody who joined us today. And, uh, you know, for our uh, uh, audience that uh, sent in some questions and comments, thank you very much for that. And um, we'll see you for the next one. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Conrad. And have a good weekend. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you, ben. Thanks, Bye. Conrad. Bye -bye. Have Bye -bye. a good day. The renewable energy industry in the Philippines is experiencing a dramatic expansion as the country faces a strong demand for new sources of power to support its rapid economic growth. With abundant sunlight, increasingly affordable technology, and growing investor interest, the solar energy sector is poised to take advantage of these opportunities. The Philippine government has allocated 7,000 megawatts of power generation to add to the country's existing capacity over the next five years. With its commitment to reduce 70% of carbon emissions by 2030, renewable energy is the most viable option to meet this tremendous demand. WeGen has entered the Philippines with a unique proposition, one that will revolutionize the energy sector. WeGen is a next-generation energy tech company that uses rapidly advancing renewable energy, battery storage, and software technologies to develop energy solutions for homes, communities, schools, and small businesses to large industrial and commercial properties, resorts, and even entire islands. Our name, WeGen, reflects our belief in the democratization of energy. We, families, communities, and businesses can produce or generate and share all the power we need, transforming consumers into prosumers. WeGen offers three distinct solutions to our customers. Residential or commercial solar solutions, solar PV, 
battery storage, and smart software solutions for homes, schools, churches, hospitals, and businesses. Produces energy bills and provides emergency power. Standalone Island Solutions replaces diesel and fossil fuels with a mix of renewables. For example, solar, wind, biomass, and smart software. Ideal for eco-resorts and small islands. And distributed power plants. Aggregation and supply of energy can serve as reserve capacity to provide power during peak load hours. At the heart of Region is its commitment to community development and social change for marginalized sectors in the country. We envision the eradication of energy poverty towards sustainable development for all. From job creation to ecological conversion, WeGen believes in expanding the horizons for underserved communities through energy aggregation and democratization. WeGen has dedicated itself to bridging gaps and building sustainable communities through clean and affordable energy solutions for all. WeGen, the power of sharing.
Digital for a year and pay less than 71 pesos per month. Visit tmt.ph digital to get your free 30 days of the Manila Times Digital Edition.